Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs of the United Kingdom, the Right Honorable George Brown. First, Mr. President, may I apologize for the of this organization. I speak to you <clears throat> as a socialist and hence as an internationalist. I've breathed and lived and worked for social democracy from my early youth and I've been inspired by the international ideals of my faith. The principles of freedom, of equality and the importance of the individual which lie at the base of our philosophy of democratic socialism are not circumscribed by national boundaries. They are not limited in their application to certain places or countries or races. They apply universally throughout the world. Thus I deem it as a great honor, as a culmination of all that I've worked for, to be able to address you today, to be able to play some part on this world stage in bringing about the ideals which have meant so much to me for so long. I do this without illusions, I hope, and without overestimation of what the United Nations can achieve. But I would like to proclaim the faith of my country and of myself in the United Nations, all that it stands for, and our determination to work in the most practical way for the fulfillment of its aims and its ideals. I have read, as you too will have done, the Secretary General's annual report. He is acting as the keeper of our conscience, recalling us to our duty and pointing out the tasks ahead. The report he makes is a disturbing one, but I believe he was right to make it. No one can honestly challenge the correctness of his diagnosis. For my part, I approach the United Nations in a mood of constructive discontent. The Secretary General and I fairly clearly have been thinking along the same lines. We today face problems of appalling gravity, but it would be strange if it were otherwise, for the United Nations is seldom called upon to intervene before a situation has proved to be beyond the resources of conventional diplomacy and beyond the wit of national statesmen. Had an effective United Nations existed in the past, it might have avoided many senseless conflicts and the insane massacres of two world wars. War has never been and never will be a solution. There are no victors in war. But no one of us seems ready yet to accept the logical consequences of this. But what do we see around us? The deep tragedy of the war in Vietnam. Less publicized battles in Africa and in Asia. Tyrannies based on race, ideology, or sheer lust for power, which deny the most basic human freedoms and the whole concept of the United Nations Charter. The pitifully slow progress towards peacemaking and peacekeeping. The failure of the, worlds of, the, of the nations of the world to disarm. The contamination of underground tests. And whole areas of the Pacific Ocean blanketed off for experiments with rockets. And perhaps in its way, most terrifying of all, the grinding misery of poverty this situation calls for imagination and for a readiness to take risks. Otherwise, we shall indeed soon be at the edge of the precipice. We all know that our long-term aim is that of general and complete disarmament under international control. We all want this to come about, but nobody in his senses thinks it's just around the corner. What we have to do, I suggest, at once, are three things. First, to recognize that the most immediate risk is presented by the possible spread of nuclear weapons to countries which do not now possess them. And recognizing that, 
to agree on the text of a non-proliferation treaty to bring this process to a halt. Second, to extend the partial test ban treaty to include underground explosions as well in order to prevent the existing nuclear powers both from developing these frightful weapons and also from devising even more dangerous systems. And third, to bring the Chinese People's Republic into the international community of nations and especially into regular and effective negotiations on disarmament. Of course, there are serious difficulties in the way of achieving even these limited objectives. But I am confident that if we look at the terrible dangers which confront us, we shall reach the conclusion that we have to solve the problems and that they can be solved if we are ready to take some calculated risks and give up a little of the mistrust and suspicion which has characterized international relations for so long. Mr. President, so much of what we have to discuss is a formidable and an awe-inspiring story. We none of us expect that the United Nations will be able to find solutions to all these problems in the next year or even in the next five years. All any of us can ask is that the organization and each of us who are members of it should go at our tasks with courage, with practical sense, and with idealism, but entirely without illusions. We must see that what the organization can bear and not place intolerable burdens upon it. We must not think that a resolution which has no connection with reality is a substitute for action. The United Nations has, of course, its role as a sounding board for world opinion, and it is in the true spirit of democracy that all should declare their beliefs here frankly and fearlessly. Let us say what we think, honestly and straightforwardly, and let us proceed to solve the problems that, of, that face the world in a practical and in a humane way. Let us really try to make the United Nations a center for harmonizing the interests of its members. Let us discuss our differences, but let us try to see the other man's point of view. Let us work in the lobbies and in the committee rooms to reach solutions. Let us never take up rigid public positions from which there is then no retreat. Our job is the peace of the world and the happiness of the human race. More than that, it is to save people, not only from the chance of battle, but from the certainty of poverty and hunger. Our business is to bring all that to an end.